So once you've picked all your sample items, you perform your auditing procedures. So if it's AR, you send out those confirmations and get those items back and then you can evaluate them. And basically what you're going to do is calculate some sort of projected misstatement based on the misstatements you have found in your sample. So we're going to continue with our example, our AR example, and do that. So we have the additional assumptions below. So we still have a 2.5 million balance and a sample size of 93 and a sampling interval of 26,882. So those were all previously established. But we now also know our confidence level is 95%. Our expected misstatement is 25,000. And our tolerable misstatement is 125,000. Okay, to come up with this upper deviation limit or upper misstatement limit, as it's called in MUS, to come up with this, even if you have zero errors, so essentially your sample deviation rate is 0%, right? Even if you have zero errors, all your confirmations come back perfect, you still have to build in your allowance for sampling error, right, before you can compare that dollar value to tolerable misstatement. So you have yet another set of tables with which to do that. I apologize that it's another set of tables. So what it is, is it's these tables. It's to help you calculate these misstatement factors. And depending on if the confidence level given in the question is 90 or 95 percent, you're going to use, again, the 90 or 95 percent confidence level table. And then you're going to use these misstatement factors. So if you have zero errors found, what you will do is you will multiply the misstatement factor by the sampling interval to compute your upper misstatement limit. And then that would be compared to your tolerable misstatement to help you draw a conclusion. Now, even if you do come up with errors, this is still an important number for your calculation, so you will have to calculate it anyway. And we will see why in a few minutes. So regardless of really of whether you have zero errors or more than zero, you will need to know this number. All right, so let's say now instead of zero errors that we unfortunately had four errors in our sample of 93. So we'd have to start off by calculating what's called the tainting factor for each of those errors. And generally what is given in the question for each of the errors would be the book value and the audit value. Okay, And then you will have to go through and compute this tainting factor. Always, that's going to be the first thing you do. So the way you calculate it is first you calculate your difference here, which is just going to be your book value less your audit value. And then your tainting factor will be your difference divided by your book value. Very simple math. What you'll be using the tainting factor for ultimately is you'll be projecting that rate of error because it just represents the rate of error within a, a particular sampling interval. So you'll be projecting that rate of error across that particular sampling interval. So that's the point of calculating it here. So the reason why this guy here is Na is because the book value of this customer or this particular item in the sample is greater than the sampling interval. Okay. So this is always going to be one of the first things you need to check when you're doing one of these MUS calculations and you are presented with the misstatements or errors that were found. You always need to check and see, okay, were there any customers or accounts tested where the book value was bigger than the sampling interval? 
because if there are any of those items, for these items, life is actually pretty simple. You don't have to calculate anything for them. And the reason for that is what we're ultimately going to do for these items where we found errors and they're smaller than the sampling interval is we're calculating the error rate. We're going to go over here and we're going to use that error rate that we calculated, which is called the tainting factor. We're going to project that tainting factor or error rate across the whole sampling interval. And then we're also going to multiply it by this misstatement factor to give an allowance for sampling risk. We don't need to do any of that for AxaCorp, where the book value is greater than the sampling interval, because we effectively did not sample from that sampling interval. We tested 100% of that sampling interval because the book value was bigger than the sampling interval, so 100% of it was tested. When we tested 100% of it, we found the difference. So we know the exact dollar value of the difference when testing 100% of the sample was 2,500, right? So this is like the factual error rate for 100% of that sampling interval was 2,500. So there's no need to bake in an allowance for sampling risk. There's no need to project this error across the sampling interval because you didn't sample. So it'll always be NA if you have a book value of one of your items over the sampling interval. Otherwise, for the rest of your items, you're going to need to perform this calculation of the tainting factor. Okay. Next, you're going to come over on this slide and you are going to list your errors in order of descending taint factor. You will notice that there is already one item on this list, right? Because our first error, if we're going by descending taint factor, should be learn heart centers, tainting factor of one, right here. But we see there's already basic precision. 1, 26882, 3 times 26882, 8646. That is already included in the calculation. And that is actually what we talked about earlier. Right? I said you're going to need this value for if there's zero errors, where we have to calculate, multiply the misstatement factor by the sampling interval. I said you're going to need it whether or not you have zero errors or whether you have more than zero errors. And what it represents, again, is allowance for sampling risk. So we are baking in allowance for sampling risk into our calculation of the upper misstatement limit in dollars. That is the purpose of including this in the calculation. This is also one of the most common errors or mistakes made in performing these calculations is people forget to include this kind of basic precision line item. So always remember to include this first. It's just gonna be three times the sampling interval if you're using 95% confidence or 2.3, I believe, yeah, 2.3 if multiplied by the sampling interval if you're using 90% confidence, right? It's always included. Then the next items, will always be your accounts listed by descending order of tainting factor. And so those tainting factors 1, 0 0.4, 0 0.15, coming straight over. So I think we called it C over A. So let's call that D. So we have D here. Okay. And then sampling interval call this E, and then your projected misstatement is just going to be F is G times E. Now, what you're effectively doing here, right, is you are projecting the misstatement rate that you found in your sample across the sampling interval as a whole. 
Because remember, with all of these guys, the book value was smaller than the sampling interval, so you did not test the whole sampling interval, right? You just tested a portion of the sampling interval. So now you want to project that 15% error rate, 40% error rate, whatever, across the rest of that particular sampling interval. So that's the purpose of this part of the calculation. So you're just multiplying these error rates by the sampling interval to get this projected misstatement column. Again, you'll only be doing that for ones where you calculated the tainting factor. If it was NA, because the book value of that account was larger than the sampling interval, then there is no need to project because there is no sampling risk, because we tested 100% of that sampling interval. So you will bring that $2,500 error straight over. This column, G, is coming from this table. It's actually these numbers here. You use these incremental increase numbers. The point of these columns is you're going to use, for column H here, you're going to multiply F by G. So you're multiplying your projected misstatement here by G to come up with this upper misstatement. Again, the point of this is to build in more allowance for sampling risk. And you are going to build in more allowance for sampling risk for each additional error that you have. If I just have one error, I would be multiplying it by 1.7. And you're going to use the incremental increase amount for each additional error. So for your second error, you'll use the 1.5. In your third error, you use the 1.4. Okay, so you see 1.7, 1.5, 1.4. And this is why this ordering here is why it's so important to remember to order correctly by descending tainting factor here. This is another common mistake people make is they forget the appropriate order when they're coming over and doing this, they just order it. They use the same order as they used over here. They're like, okay, it was one, two, three here. I'm gonna order it one, two, three here. They forget they order it by descending taint factor and they're gonna be multiplying it by the wrong numbers when they get over here to this part of the calculation and they're gonna wind up with the wrong answers. Okay, so that's why this whole descending taint factor thing is so important. So you multiply your projected misstatement by the incremental increases of misstatement factor here. That is going to get you these additions to the upper misstatement limit. Again, you don't have to do that for AXA Corp because the purpose of this part of the calculation is to build in more allowance for sampling risk. And I don't have to do that for this item because I tested 100% of that sampling interval, right? No sampling was done, don't need to build in an allowance for sampling risk. And you can see why here, if we think back to the advantages and disadvantages of MUS on that very early slide, when it talks about how if more than a few misstatements are detected, the sample results calculations might start overstating allowance for sampling risk. You can see how that starts to happen over here, right? Because each additional error you have results in a greater allowance for sampling risk being built in to this calculation, which results in an even larger and larger and larger upper misstatement limit. And remember, at the end of the day, this upper misstatement limit is going to be compared to TM. So if the upper misstatement limit is larger and larger and larger, then I'm more and more and more and more likely to reject this account and think that this account is materially misstated. So that is what that third disadvantage was referencing. So this is just going over that. It's saying, okay, you, you finally have your upper misstatement limit and then you compare that to 
tolerable misstatement. So in our case here, it was 125K. So we would conclude here the account balance was materially misstated. So here's some things you could do. We could, in theory, increase the sample size. Obviously, if you do that, you are hoping you don't find any more errors because that would just make your UML worse. You could perform alternative procedures. You could ask that they adjust the AR balance. So obviously what this means is you are putting that projected misstatement, right? This 15621, we are saying, okay, AR is misstated by this much, and you would actually be recording that amount in our summary of audit differences or SAD, right, that we talked about in chapter three. And that would be included as a proposed audit adjustment. And you would ask that the client record it. And then if management refuses to adjust it and it's truly material, you could theoretically consider issuing a qualified or adverse opinion. And this is an evaluation table, which is very similar to what we saw in chapter eight but it's just showing this sort of decision table for a substantive testing approach. So it's saying, okay, you can have the true state of the account balance, right? Kind of like how we had the true state of the control and the true state of the account balance will be materially misstated or not. And then this is what the auditor thinks based on what the sample tells them, right? So the sample is gonna tell them it's not misstated or it is misstated. And then these things uh, will either cause them to get a correct decision if they line up right correctly or they'll make the type 1 or the type 2 error. Now we briefly talk here about the effect of understatement misstatements. Right? As we said earlier, MUS is not good at detecting understatements. It is not designed to detect understatements. It's not good at it. Right. But if you do encounter an understatement, misstatement, this is how you would account for it in the calculation. There are actually a couple different ways you could do it, but this is one way you would account for it in the calculation. And by understatement, misstatement, we mean book value is 2000, my audit value is greater, so I actually wind up with a negative tainting factor. In this case, you would multiply your negative tainting factor by your sampling interval, just like we did before, to project that error across the sampling interval, you're essentially going to get the negative 2688. And then the thing it advises you to do is it says you shouldn't also multiply, so it's basically, okay, I have negative 2688. It says, all right, I wouldn't also want to multiply my 2688 by a misstatement limit to add in the allowance for sampling risk and make it even an even larger negative number here. And basically the point of that is just to be as conservative as possible. We don't want to be backing out a huge amount, but at the same time, we do want to account for the fact that there is this negative number and there was understatement, misstatement, not just overstatement, misstatements. So what it says to do is just take your negative 2688 right over here and net it against these positive amounts, and that will give you 147,930 as your new upper misstatement limit. I've also read things where it says, okay, you could just not include it at all, like just ignore it in, in terms of the upper misstatement limit. So your upper misstatement limit in that case would still be 15621. What you would not do is use the absolute value and make the upper misstatement limit even larger. That would not be necessary. 